Hey, everybody, welcome back to Autism Confidential, the podcast from the National Council on Severe Autism. I am Jill Escher. I'm president of NCSA and your host today. And today we have a really exceptionally cool, fabulous episode. Um, We're doing something we've never done before. And we are doing this at the suggestion of one of our favorite guests, Tom McKean. Say hi, Tom. Hi, guys. Uh, you'll recognize him uh, from previous episodes. Um, he is a longtime um, autism advocate and self-advocate, really one of the pioneering self-advocates. Um, he, Temple Grandin, and some other in the very early days of autism advocacy. We owe a debt of gratitude to him for all that he has done and continues to do um, for us and for um, all the families accept, uh, affected by autism. And um, so his suggestion was that we have a guest, a very, very special guest in my opinion, um, somebody who uh, has has been on sort of the opposite pole of where NCSA has been, um, but this is also somebody who has deliberately reached out to us wanting to promote positive and constructive dialogue, and I give her a huge amount of credit for that. So please, everybody, welcome Morenica Giwa Onewu, and I hope I pronounced it correctly. You're close. Marena K. Giwal Naiwu. Hi, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Don't throw tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no tomatoes, no virtual tomatoes. We're really, really um, happy that, that you're here. As I said, this is sort of a first on our podcast, and I think it's great. So thank you, Tom, for the suggestion. Um, mm-hmm. So Tom comes to us from Ohio. Marenica is in um, Houston, Texas. I'm in, I'm in California. Um, thank goodness uh, for Zoom and the internet for allowing <laughs> us to be together here. Now, um, some of you know, you know who followed NCSA, you will know that Marenica has not always been gentle with her opinions. <laughs> she is a prolific writer and uh, she has written some things that have been um, not very positive about us. Um, she has called us, um, and you know, I, I'm sorry if I offend anybody, privileged, non-autistic, literal cure bee martyr moms. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Um, she, said, she has said that we push a segregationist eugenic agenda. Of course, I disagree with all these things, but I'm just telling you what the past has been. Um, she has called our followers true, obedient, brainwashed sheeple. Um, and we are ableist, narcissistic, people. And then when we wrote about um, our opposition to sort of the cleansing of the autism vocabulary that we felt that we needed, quote unquote, the full semantic toolbox to address the full spectrum of autism, um, she did was in vehement disagreement with us about that. Um, and she called us highly privileged, well-connected grievance fringe group notorious for mischaracterizations and exaggerations so egregious that they rival best-selling fiction novels. Um, Morinica is a great writer, by the way. I don't agree with what, what she's saying here, but she has power of the pen. I will grant you that. Um, she says that what she has written is full of misinformation and um, deceptive posturing um, and that we're all about woe is me and we beat our breasts. Um, so anyway, um, you can see that she has some pointed words about what we've said in the past, but then she, she reaches out to us and says, you know what, here we are, we're speaking in bubbles. Mm -hmm. We're speaking to ourselves. Let's go across the bridge. Let's talk to each other. Let's see each other as human beings rather than these kind of two dimensional kind of parodies, right. Or caricatures. And I honestly, I give her a lot of credit and I was just thrilled. I had a long, an hour long conversation with her. Um, some time ago, and I learned a lot about her and her thinking. Again, I didn't say I I agreed with her about everything. But here, now we have her today, and we want to talk about bridging bridging the divide. So, Veronica, let's let's start with you. And um, I'd love to know, really, um, what motivated you to write these things um, about us, and then to really reach out to us, trying to really get to understand each other better. Sure, and I was lis- I was listening to it. I was like, whoa, I called the listeners sheeple. Oh, that was kind of, <laughs> but I did, um, among other things that I've stated. And so um, for me, um, I had some, some 
concerns with some of the, I reviewed the information that NCSA um, shares because I feel like they're, um, I know now we have a few organizations. I know that the Profound Autism Alliance, you know, has formed and there's a few groups that are uh, working with this population, but truly it seemed like um, this was the primary organization that was speaking for individuals who have, you know, are, would qualify for the profound autism, um, you know, categorization or who are, are really, you know, you know, highly impacted in a way, you know, much more so than, you know, myself or Thomas. And so I felt like because of the fact that this is a vulnerable pop population that isn't, um, that doesn't have the um, collective voice that it should, um, it was difficult and problematic, some of the um, positions that were being shared. Like I looked through the, the position statements, um, some of the videos, um, some of the, um, the the terminology, and I just felt really concerned um, that it seemed like um, a by any means necessary type of approach that, um, you know, that was well intended, but was um, ultimately harmful for people. Um, and it also felt very gaslighty. I felt like like very targeted in a number of the different things that were written because of there have been a number because I'm um, I serve on the the IAC the you know, interagency autism coordinating um, committee and there have been a lot of pointed things written about the um, people the autistic people who are on it and then the direction of the committee as a whole so I felt like you know for those of us who are public you know if you're just sharing things publicly if you're advocating publicly then you need to also take public criticism you know and that a lot of things have been stated th that are very subjective you know that have been written in a way that I felt were um you know, very emotive and not necessarily always fact-based and um, portraying things as if this was like a zero sum game with, you know, one side against the other. So can you, can I you give me just some examples? Yeah, I, I don't blame you for being, I think all of us are emotional about this subject. Honestly, I don't blame anybody for that. But can you give us some examples of, yes. of you know, what, where you think we were doing something harmful? Yes. So I felt so well, one that I can go to that it like is a recurring issue is the mischaracterization of neurodiversity. Um, I find that to be a problem. And some of that, I think um, some of the, the, uh, the fault lies on behalf of the people of everyone who jumps online and, and claims themselves to be a neurodiversity advocate when they may not even really understand neurodiversity, but the portrayal of neurodiversity as a perspective that sees autism is only a difference, only positive. No, there's no disabling factors to it. Um, it's, um, you know, all of these types of things like this, this sunshine and rainbows mischaracterization was very frustrating for me because that is not the perspective of neurodiversity that you can have no type of assistance or intervention that you don't, that there is no relevance to a family, um, to, you know, like to family or community or anything like that. It, that's actually really contrary to disability justice. Um, principles of which neurodiversity aligns fairly closely with. And this, and so I just felt like it, it was kind of a um, mischaracterized the, this position so that no one will agree with it. Um, and there, and then and divide in terms of um, there could be no type of understanding, empathy, or awareness whatsoever of individuals who are, uh, you know, who have, you know, intellectual disability, or who have aggression, or who have cognitive disability, you know, uh, you know, you know, minimally speaking, or any of these things, I just felt like it was this, your high functioning little snowflakes who are mild, you know, nothing about what this is like, and you think that this is a great thing, and you think that it has no negatives whatsoever, and you're out of touch with reality. Got it. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to um, agree with you about, there, there are two words that I find really difficult. <laughs> um, neurodiversity is one of them. I think you, you nailed it. I, mean, I think it kind of means different things to different people, right? And um, we might be using it in a way that you might not consider it. Other advocates might not consider it, but others, others might. Um, another one is ableism to this day. Thomas and I have talked about this quite a bit yeah. on the podcast. I'm like, gosh, could someone please define ableism for me? That Those, those are two it's words that are- the central part of my dissertation, ableism. It's like a huge deal. Like, so surprising to me that neither, you know, that neither of you, like I watched the podcast could define it, but I do, I think that you are correct when you said that there are people having different perspectives of like neurodiversity and of ableism. I think I'm just going to be honest here. I'm just going to say that some people are calling certain things ableism that are not ableism. 
I mean, let's just be real here. Like that's just like some people might pull a gender card or a race card. There are very much is gender um, disparity. There's very much race. All of these things exist, but there are some people who misuse these things. I think the concern that I have is just like with woke and canceled, how they are totally, absolutely bastardized and misused in a way that's frankly racist and disrespectful to the black community from which the word the words came. Um, the misportrayal of neurodiversity is such to where why would any parent who's coming into this be think that they would want to have anything to do with that? Like the way that it's presented and shared, I wouldn't want, if, if that's really what it was, I wouldn't want to be part of it. So it just, to me is like, I, I don't know where people are getting their information from, but I think too much, too much, assum too many assumptions are being made everywhere by everyone. It isn't just NCSA. I think there's a lot of assumptions being made by, um, you know, autistic adults, um, who are, you know, frequently online or who advocate about parents. And some, I think some of those, uh, some, a lot of those assumptions are completely inaccurate. I think that um, we all need to kind of sit down and, and look at the reality because I think we, we all have a very skewed reality of one another. Well, I think, you know, the problem is, you know, reality is incredibly diverse, right? That's true. And so I definitely think that neurodiversity is a thing, right? The, it, neurodiversity is in my mind, by definition, non-pathological. It's mm -hmm. not a disorder. Neurodiversity mm -hmm. is exactly what it says. It's a diversity, it is benign, right? It's a mm -hmm. difference. Everything you, you are saying it's not, you're saying, well, no, neurodiversity mm -hmm. actually it does bleed into pathology and disorder. Um, and yeah. you know, requiring treatments, et cetera. And I would say, well, then it does it have a cause that's not necessarily natural? Should we be talking about prevention as well? Because everybody that I've talked to who really take a neurodiversity perspective are opposed to research on causation and and um, and treatment and prevention. So I mean, yeah. it's sort of mushy because it's like my understanding, these are not perfect terms that have mm -hmm. a perfect boundary and understanding. Um, and so you know, given this sort of crazy diversity, um, you know, we're we're inevitably going to to disagree. I mean, yeah. I I look at I my also children. Feel like people don't go to the source. Like they you know, these terms like neurodiversity was coined by Judy Singer. Neurodivergence was coined by Kasiana Sastamasu. They've been cited in literature. Like I feel like people just go with. If you Google something, you know, chances are most likely the answer you're going to get is in inaccurate. It's somebody something from Wikipedia, something from somebody's blog, um, and it's usually you know, and things do do evolve over time and can have different meanings. But I think that when people are not trying you know, like, I, I feel like the meaning that is ascribed to something by its community is the meaning that should be honored most and not, and not, you know, like, um, pejorative, um, there were, uh, you know, derivatives of that. Okay. But I'm still sorry, you're about to say something about your children. No, 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 yeah. that's okay. Do, do me a favor. Give me your definition of neurodiversity. Sure. So do you want neurodiversity, the neurodiversity paradigm or neurodiversity movement? Because they are three, they're <laughs> different things. So um, that's where I think that people, where people kind of get confused. It's kind of like if I was asked to ask someone to define woke, almost, I, I guarantee the majority of people will give me the wrong definition because like, it's, it's like a joke. Like it's a term that's existed for decades since before I was born in, in the black community. But if you are on social media, it means something completely different. And it's just like shameful. Like, <laughs> well, um, it, it, your, your definition of neurodiversity, just the word. Sure. All right, so neurodiversity um, and Judy Singer will disagree with me, um, but like I think they, um, the neurodiversity, as I understand it, is a concept that's essentially our reality. It's it talks about the concept of neurological diver biodiversity, and just like in biodiversity, we have all these different biomes. We have heterogeneity of species, and that's what what has allowed for life. There are no um, there is no one type of neurology. Um, every human falls under neurodiversity. That's neurotypicality. That's intellectual disability, that's um, dyscalculia, uh, dyspraxia, um, autism, ADHD, um, all of these things fall under the different um, forms of diversity that uh, that exist in human, you know, like neurology of human minds. Now, there are neural minorities that kind of differ more from the more standard way of thinking, because even to people who are allegedly neurotypical, 
have different brains. They think differently. They're not at all clones of one another. They're unique individuals, but there are certain things, you know, like handedness, just like when you would think about handedness, 90% of the population is right right-handed, only 10% of the population is left-handed or ambidextrous. So it's a smaller percentage of people who diverge from the dominant handedness. And that's what the case is with neurology. There are um, certain um, features of, you know, of neurology that one can find that differ from the more typical um, mechanisms of processing, speaking, and understanding. Is there ever a brain that has that, is, that has um, features of pathology and disorder as opposed to diversity? Well, I mean, when you look at biodiversity, that like in, in nature, there's, there's pathology. You know what I mean? Like it's a part of nature. It's a part of life. Nature is not benign. Nature is not kind. Nature is doggy dog, <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, and so there are aspects of nature that are, you know, you, you can find strengths, you know, if you look at, you know, like if you look in, in science, you can find things that are neutral characteristics and you can find things that are, are um, you know, are, are challenging. You know, there are certain, there's a reason why um, they, you know, like there's certain, why people, you know, like for example, constant identity is a problem because of the having genes that are too close to one another and the possibilities of health problems that can result as, you know, given that. And so there's a reason why you want to have different types of plants or, you know, what have you, because, because of the, their ability to survive. So just something is nat can be natural, doesn't always mean everything about it is necessarily beneficial. Natural, so, um, but not all, brains are wired naturally. Obviously, we can look at many, many instances of that. Let's say something like fetal alcohol, alcohol yeah, spectrum like disorder. Um, yeah, yeah, let's say, you know, prematurity, you know, early life infection, um, yes. there are heritable aspects, for example, um, with exposure to um, certain anti-epileptic drugs. I mean, I can go on and on and on yes. with examples. Yes. Would would you consider those to be neurodiversity? Everything is neurodiversity. If the fact that they're different from one another is means that they're so every type of brain is neurodiversity. Yours is, mine is, Thomas's is. There's not a human being for alive. We are we are an example of neurodiversity. Neurodiversity is everyone. There's no, you know, people can say they don't believe in it or they don't agree with it, but it's just a fact that's like we could say we don't care, we don't believe in biodiversity, that doesn't stop it from being true. It, it is the truth of our of, of nature of our planet. But what are the practical implications of this perspective, Morenica? So, for example, you know there are those in the neurodiversity movement um, who oppose treatment, who oppose research yes. into causation and prevention. Yes. In yes. your but paradigm, you wouldn't be opposed to that. Oh well, no, no. So that's what I'm saying. There's neurodiversity. There's a neurodiversity paradigm, and there's the neurodiversity movement. They're all very different. I can't keep it. Okay, that's a little bizarre to me. I have to admit that makes no sense. It's one one word. I'm going to quickly turn turn to Thomas. Thomas, mm -hmm. what's, what's your understanding of neurodiversity? I I came in here with the understanding that I was going to disagree with her, but um, and I do to some extent, I guess, but I do agree with a lot of what she said. Uh, neurodiversity is kind of a kind of a word that you know I I kind of um, I kind of stay away from it because. You know, as she said, no one really seems to understand what it means. And if you ask 10 people, you're going to get 10 different answers because uh, it's different for everyone. I always thought of it more as um, I, I see where she's coming from and, and she may be right about that. The, the way I personally always saw it was um, more of a, uh, um, I guess something going on that would um, somehow negatively affect um, quality of life as something like a, uh, a more serious kind of autism or, or as she was saying, a ADHD or some other kind of, you know, neurological disorder, 
I, I do get what she's saying about the diversity part. If you look at the three of us that are on the screen that I'm looking at, you know, all three of us are very different. There is diversity there. And that includes, you know, up here neurologically with all three of us. So yes, neuro, neurodiversity does kind of apply if you apply it in that literal sense. And I think that's what she's doing. I, I'm not really sure, I guess, the way that um, the way that it's seen now or the way that other people perceive it, if they see it like I do or she does or in some other kind of way, I always kind of thought that it was more of a um, um, this individual has some kind of um, something going on, if, if that makes any kind of sense. Yeah, I, I it, generally I think it's in my opinion, you know, it's used not in the way that you guys have said, which is sort of like every brain is different. Everybody's neurodiverse. We're all kind of part of this uh, big biological, um, uh, you know, kind of painting and it, we're all different colors in the painting kind of thing. No, I mean, I, I, in my experience, neurodiversity has been pretty much a euphemism for some form of mental infirmity. Okay. I'm just, yeah. that's, that's how I've seen it. Yeah. And, and I, we're not going to answer this today. Yeah. Obviously I think, you know, um, I do, I do think that this goes to, to the heart of some of the things that are behind some of the things you've written about us, that I do think there are some fundamental disconnects in how we, in the language that we use and um, kind of our, our experiences and, and our premises. But, you know, when, when, when Marnica and I were um, emailing before this, I said, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on philosophy because <laughs> at the end of the day, what NCSA cares about is solutions, you know, pragmatic responses to the crises that are being experienced in communities across our country. That's mm -hmm. what we're, we're about. And I know that you're very, very sympathetic to that as well, um, which is great. And mm -hmm. I, I really wanted to kind of move the discussion there because, she, you know, as she said to me, you know, she's very interested in, in, reaching across this chasm, you're bridging the divide. She doesn't want to see this field become increasingly burdened and hampered by the, you know, these slings and arrows, right, that are constantly being tossed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, moving forward constructively is absolutely the right thing that everyone should be doing. But mm -hmm. What is constructively? You know, here's the problem that we've had at NCSA that a lot of the things that matter to our community are very much denigrated by the broader disability rights movement of which I think you are part. And so I, I although I agree with you, like, hey, let's work together, th there are some fundamental disconnects there. And I want to talk about that. Like, you know, we are in a position now where we, you know, families are just desperate, absolutely desperate for help. They're living with children and adult children with absolutely catastrophic disabilities. Mm -hmm. They're not neurodiverse. These are people who are seriously impaired and can never well, care. We're all, we're all neurodivergent in our own ways. So well, like, you just, listen, I, I, I would yeah. never compare my minor hardships to you know, uh, a, a kid who's punching out the walls every day. Yes, yeah. but it's not about the hard. But it's not about toilet. the hardship, though. I think that's the part. Like I agree, there are definitely different manifestations. But I think it's like. Um, but I think that the the misunderstanding is that it doesn't capture these people. Like I'm a human, you're a human, Thomas is a human. We're all very different, but we're th that doesn't change that reality. Um, there are a number of very very different things about us. Um, someone like, you know, like I have a son who has um, intellectual disability. He is not, you know, he's not going to sit up here and, you know, give keynote speeches and all of these types of things like, you know, um, or, or anything of that nature. If, you know, we've had issues, we've had our gates and our alarms, so, you know, I've had a, a loper, a wanderer, you know, mm -hmm. we've had um, incontinence, we've had all these types of things. So I wouldn't, it would be preposterous for me to say that, oh, 
person A's experience is exactly identical to person B's experience. It is not. And it's an insult, frankly, to say that because difference exists, but it doesn't make it any less nor diverse. I think when the term is used to mean, oh, only high functioning people who are doing, who are just socially awkward, but everything that they're cool, you know, they're good, then that's when we're, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. It's about the inherent value of human beings, period, even with their deficits. And that isn't something that's new to autism. That's something that they originated from the disability community, from disabled people themselves. Um, and not just from like our families, our allies are important, but they, they are part, they have a voice. They are not the only voice. It is supposed to be a collective collaborative voice. And so a lot of the things that are concerning to me are things that are, are, are you know staunch principles of, of disability, you know justice and and rights in general are things that are being um, you know attacked um, you know by people um, because I think that people don't understand like the there could be a need there's I think there's I think that people aren't talking about the things that we agree on there I think we agree that there's nowhere near enough services. I think that what is I think what is happening. I think it's ridiculous that people, um, when my children were diagnosed, they, we, we got put on the so-called ten-year um, wait list for services. We're still on it. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I think most families, like it's a joke in terms of the uh, services that you are able to receive if you're able to receive any um, the. the um, clinicians who are qualified to be able to treat your child or who will even listen to you about what's going on with them, um, the, the schooling options. I think that what people are facing, uh, you know, it's devastating and it's, it's, it's not right. It's, it's horrible, but that is not about the, that, that problem is more about, um, I think we have a lot of issues in society in terms of that we're not funding the right things, we're not direct service support, things that can practically impact people's lives are not being funded. And I think that some of the, the things, you know, like some of the solutions that I, you all have shared are solutions that concern me a great deal. Like, I, you know, I think that we need to look at, at things in a, in a neutral manner, you know, such as like what, you know, like integration and community living. I, you know, I know that, for example, I'm just going to say, that for many people, regardless of, of how their disability presents, regardless of if they, you know, um, if they are um, incontinent, if they are severely cognitively disabled, um, they um, need assistance with mobility, um, they have a severe um, self-injurious behavior, these people are not like getting treated well. And it's, if you're in an institution, if you're in a supported living center, um, you're not getting treated well. When your family comes to visit you, are you getting treated well? But rest of the time, you're not getting treated well. I, I come from a community where most of the people who provide those services are people who look like me. I have people that I know who've worked in those those settings their entire life. My best friend's mother, in fact, works for one here that was almost shut down in the state of Texas. These places aren't the aren't what you all think them to be. I'm not saying that these group homes and isolated apartment solutions are the greatest thing either. But you know, these places. Um, don't have to be Willowbrook to be problematic. They don't have to have 6,000 people shoved in a room. They don't have that, but they're still, they're, they're, it, it's still not the best solution. It, it's not, it's typically removed from um, the, you know, the metropolitan area. Um, it has people who has a lot of, there's a lot of attrition. There's a lot of um, sanctions and fees and things that people are doing that are against policy. Um, there are people often who work there who've lost licensure. It's kind of like a dumping ground type of thing, you know place where, okay, you got a record, you can go work there. And that's not the best solution for anyone, and especially someone who can't um, advocate for themselves or speak or any of these things. That's a bad place to be. And I don't, that's not a solution. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't go to rock bottom and be like, well, we need this. This is all we've got. No, we should demand more. Honey, I, I'm not disagreeing with you at all. I mean, I think that when we look out on the landscape of options that are, that are out there for they adults, suck. it it sucks. It mm -hmm. sucks. And I feel like, you know, this is the big elephant in the room. You know, we, we tend to divert ourselves, I think, and pay attention to these small things that are of such marginal importance to our, our loved ones who mm -hmm. are disabled. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, 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 my kids could not care. I mean, Tom and I have talked about this. They couldn't mm -hmm. care less about the puzzle piece. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, they couldn't care less about you know how we use you know this term or that term they care about their quality about of life moving forward, forward. that's exactly. 
And that's, and I feel like, God, can we just talk about that and put everything else? I think 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 we're on the same page. But I think we get stuck in these other things because I think people, to other people, it's semantics. Like to me, you know, hearing like, oh, who cares about a puzzle piece or whatever, whatever I'm thinking about, I come from a, a group of people to where the, the word that's on my birth certificate is not even a, 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 you know, a proper word to call people of my racial background, you know what I mean? Like, but it's literally on there and, you know, and um, because of, you know, dating myself and I'm an extennial, you know, but um, I think that, so I think to some people, it's like, I think that's the problem. The disconnect is the way we think, like there is a person named Jules Edwards, who says, talks about the top down versus, you know, um, bottom up approach of thinking. And that when parents come into a situation, they're like, look, my child's self-injuring. This is going on. The school is is not honoring the IEP. I can't get respite. Um, the third provider in three months just quit. This, any other, this, any other. And then an autistic person is listening to that. And they're like, you use person for language, you know, use functioning labels, you use, and it's kind of like you're focusing on, to them, that stuff jumps out, like it's, it hurts, it's like, but to the person is thinking about, I don't care about what I'm saying, can you get to the core of what I mean, but some of us get stuck in the outer things, um, because they, before we can get to the point, because to us, those things, they, those things do matter, because, you know, th- that's how we've dehumanized people throughout, you know, in, in legislation and throughout history, through terminology and so forth. These things look small, but they're big. But the big, but I do agree with you. People are majoring in minor things. And um, no, I don't want uh, a puzzle piece because I don't, you know, like the, uh, the, the history of it. And Thomas, that's where you and I will disagree, because what you all did with the Autism Society doesn't erase the history that it had for decades prior to that to me but what when I think I wish people would sit and talk and say okay let's try to be respectful let's have an understanding let's talk about these bigger issues let's talk about the fact that no matter where you are on the spectrum if you've never ever been around anybody who's you know who's got you know higher support needs because some people haven't like you know I'm a parent and I degrees in special education I went back to school after my children's diagnoses because I saw how families were getting railroaded and I didn't want anybody to be treated like that mm. um and, and so I felt like I had to learn because they will screw you over if you don't know your rights, if you don't know, if you don't read every every guideline, if you don't challenge every, um, you know, FIE and all this kind of stuff. And so, um, and, and parents have enough to do, shouldn't have to do that. It's it's tiresome to have to fight that people are supposed to help you. But I think that, all, you know, even people who don't know about something could still rally behind it and support it. Because it, the, the truth is there are not suitable employment opportunities. There are not suitable um, healthcare opportunities. There are not suitable recreational opportunities, housing for families. It's just, it just isn't. The majority of people are, are you know, like basically, bur- are, you, know, um, you know, bearing the cost themselves, second, third mortgaging their homes, you know, sometimes divorcing so that they can stay, one person can stay here where their child can get this service or that service. Um, looking yeah. to their, you know, looking to the older children, the older siblings and, and asking them if they'll consider, you know, like guardianship in the future and all of these types of things, because they're not, they're, you know, um, they aren't getting what they need. You aren't getting people to come in and help bathe them. You aren't getting people to come in and provide services. They say that they are and they dock their records and they're really not. It's like, there's a, I feel like we're fighting each other when all of these people have got billions of dollars that they're doing to, to research how many rats smelled each other's butt. And does that mean that they're more autistic or not if you gave them this injection? Like, like how is that changing anybody's life today, tomorrow, or, or in 10 years? I feel like there's a lot of ethereal things that are being loaded around and spent money being spent on that doesn't help people. And I think one of the things that disgusts me the most is how in the hell can anybody have NIH or HRSA or whatever research and then you exclude people with intellectual disability from like all your studies? Like what the freak? How how can you do that? How is that even ethical? Like it's disgusting. But I feel like so I, I feel like there's a lot, you know, I don't know. I guess I feel like we all spend time talking about things that don't matter and these bigger things that, that we care about just get left, left in the dust. Well, total agreement there. I mean, that's, um, that's, I think, where we have the most in common is that I mean, you just had like a perfect encapsulation, I think, of many of the shortcomings of our system. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, to me, the question is, how do we proactively and constructively, you know, move forward to address that? You know, um, I agree. I'm like, the, the, you know, you, you're reaching out to us as a sign that like, you know, all this sniping is getting us nowhere. You've, yes. you've said that yourself. 
Mm-hmm. We don't want to be just spinning our wheels. We want to do things that, you know, benefit, you know, this population that desperately need, needs help. I mean, Thomas, I mean, I know you interact all the time with autism families, right? Mm-hmm. What, what, are, what are their priorities? What, what do they express to you? I've been interacting lately with the um, with the families of of the more severe, and you know what they've been telling me is, you know, they don't care about the puzzle piece. They don't care about person first language. They don't care about those things on the surface. They want to do something to help their kids and improve those kids quality of life um regarding the puzzle piece i will say we were not and and people who are against it listen listen we were not trying to erase the history we can't do that history cannot be erased you know this the this the slavery cannot be erased that happened and what happened with the puzzle piece cannot be erased i i will say though that that the reason that the the crying child puzzle piece was there the reason that there was a hopeless puzzle piece in 1963 is because autism was hopeless in 1963 there was absolutely nothing there and but there was the children changed. that they criticized not autism they said these are puzzling children who don't fit into society who this like the the onus was made on the, the problem of the child being different and not on the fact that society was so intolerant of the of them you're right and and that has changed and the fact that you and i are are here on this podcast now is proof of that we were not trying to erase history we were very much aware of the history of the puzzle piece when we put that together and we were trying to kind of flip that on its ear a little bit we were trying to create something more positive and if you look beyond what they are perceiving it means and you go back to its creation and you see what we were doing and why we put it together and what those colors and interlocks actually do represent and what we meant them to represent and what they officially represent you will see that it is a symbol of respect that's the way that we created it that's what we were going for we were saying let's do away with this this thing that does not respect the autistic population let's kind of change that let's do something with that so it does and there are people who who are unable for whatever reason to see the difference between the two of them yes. now it re- okay hey listen we're going to move from okay. this discussion, because yeah. as I said, right. I really want well, to emphasize I, I did, sort of- I did want to move on. Yeah. Okay, um, go ahead. So something else I wanted to say is is to move to move on, like Jill said, to what we're supposed to be discussing, <laughs> and and thank you for letting me rant about that <laughs> a little bit. Um, you know, you're right. We we do have to get on the same page, and I think I think a big part of the problem, at least by my perception, you know, is that um, there are a lot of the, 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 how do I say this politely, because we're on a podcast, Uh, there are, there are, let's say individuals, let's say there are individuals out there who, who do not seem to be able to understand or perceive that, that parents perceive perceive autism in a different way than those who have it do the parents look at it from the point of view of a parent and that's not wrong it's not wrong for a parent to have a a 
parental view of autism. That is exactly also, what they are what supposed other to do. Have? You're a parent. Like it's kind of unfair to expect. Like I'm, 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 I'm a parent as well as an autistic person, and like I can't take away my parent hat. Like it's there. I'm an autistic right. person, but there's things as a parent that, and I will say that I, I feel that that is a huge problem. And so, like when we talked about, like practically, what are some of the things people can do that are practical to help? I think that people should be careful not to speak about things that they are not well nuanced about. If you have never raised any children, don't know anything about children, don't have any children, um, aren't, you know, aren't a specialist in, 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 you know, child development or anything like that, you have some insight on what it's like to be a child because you were one, an autistic child, but you don't have insight on everyone's child or on every situation. And so I think that you should, um, I think that everyone doesn't need to, to speak for every situation. Um, people should sometimes um, there are certain things that are universally helpful for individuals, regardless of their, you know, their presentation or their level one, level two, level three. And there are certain things that are more applicable to one group than another. And I think that people should be careful not to, um, not to, don't talk about something that you don't know. Like, if you don't know anything about you, like, like, this is one problem thing that I have concern with. There, there are people, we can take autism out of it. There are human beings who are horrible parents, right? There's human beings that are horrible spouses and partners. <laughs> you know, there's abusive, mm -hmm. crappy, terrible people. Mm -hmm. So let's just be honest. There are. So are there some autism parents that are trash? Yes. Just like there's none <laughs> autism parents that are trash. Mm -hmm. But the majority of parents, I think, we have our good days and our bad days, you know, depends. but the majority of parents care. They may not have get everything right. There's no manual to parent, but they parenting, but they care. And I think that that is something that people need to understand is that even if people are misinformed or maybe bumbling around and making mistakes, their their heart is there. They care. This isn't just something to do. This is their, This is something. This isn't something. This isn't a passing phase. This is their their lives. And so while they might need help, you know, like you know, we we all need help, you know, like in terms of like you know, understanding things or finding resources or developing things that help and support. Attacking people doesn't do anything but, but cause problems. I think looking at every parent as if they're a problem, they're an abuser, they're this or that, is terrible. Um, that's not helpful to anyone. Um, because frankly, a lot of people, you take parenting out of it, a lot of people are abusive. There's a lot of microaggressions or abuses or things that we do as humans, we're not perfect. Um, I think people blow up ableism like ableism is a fact of life we were all this is an ableist society that we live in but it, it's like it's like there's a big difference between someone who is wearing a kkk hood and burns crosses in the yard and then someone who maybe um you know says some things that are you know probably bigoted and unkind but um it, they're not the same you can't conflate the same they're both problematic they might come from the same source but they're they're not the same at all percentage wise one is a great deal more um, harmful in the in the short run, you know, although they're both harmful in the long run. And so I think that one thing people can do is I think that they need to stop and think and, and choose their words carefully, not just parents, autistic people too. Some of the things that people say that they go off on or they get upset about um, derail the conversation. And I think also it's important to be clear that some, some of the things that we're sharing, that we're talking about when they are relevant to people who's, who are you know, significantly different than we are. We need to make that explicit. Because I think there's, there's issues, there's policies, there's things that people are concerned about that are just as beneficial, if not more so, for people who are you know, cognitively impaired or non-speaking than those of us. Like I'm a, I'm a non-speaking person some part of the time, but I can speak. More than 60% of the time I can speak. There are some times that I cannot. Whereas there's some people who cannot reliably speak hardly at all and make, maybe make some vocalizations. Talking about like AAC and um, having a proxy and supports and things like that are, are so much more important for those individuals than me because some of the time I can get my words out mo more likely than not. So I think that um, the I, what I see with autism is what I see in the Black community. Um, there are a whole lot of, it's getting a little better now, but there's a whole lot of people who are really, really light skinned who are the face of Blackness. And people who are dark like me, features like mine, they're not. And so it's kind of like when people think black, you know, they think Halle Berry or whatever, I, that doesn't look like me. And so it's kind of like, I think that's the way the parents are. They're thinking, whoa, all these depictions of autism have not, don't seem at all relevant to my child. But the role of people like the Halle Berries and whatnot and the Dorothy Dangerous is, is to, to open the door for all of us. 
You know, the reason why, you know, Barack Obama um, was able to be president for a number of reasons, someone in my complexion probably would not have been. You know, I'm just being honest. There's sometimes some people have privilege, whether they ask for it or not, opens the door for them, but you should open the door for everyone else. And I think that's the concern. A lot of people, autistic people have a platform. We have a voice. We have the attention of people. We need to be using that voice to share not just the issues that are relevant to a, one portion of the population, but to the population overall. And I think that that's not happening explicitly enough. And that's where the concern lies with parents. And they're like, you can't, how can you speak for me? You don't even know what's going on with my kid. You don't even know what we need. You know, you're sharing things that um, that don't aren't relevant to our, our lives. And, and then yet you're shutting me out. And I think that's where the problem is. We're not, you know, like we're not hearing each other. Yeah, I, you know, I, I see your point in part. And again, I, I'm going to try to turn this conversation back to sort of more practical matters. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's been uh, quite a bit of advocacy on the part of people who are, I'll call them high functioning. I'm sorry, I know people don't like that term, but it works for me. Um, that has been quite clearly contrary to the interests of those like my children who are low functioning. And, um, you know, this, this would include, um, you know, you know, advocacy around, um, uh, 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 you know, a sub minimum wage, minimum right? Because you've employment. attacked us for that. Yes. Um, it would include advocacy about restricting access to different kinds of housing options. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it would probably, you know, include, um, so there's been a lot of advocacy opposing research into biology and treatments. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think that sometimes you're right that you could have people who are sort of a gateway into sort of the larger community, but, but sometimes, sometimes what they say people is that what are want contrary to our interests. And, you know, listen, we are at a point now where 3% of all US children have autism. This mm -hmm. is not a small population. This mm -hmm. is a, an absolutely massive gargantuan population. And there mm -hmm. is room in this population for a huge diverse array of approaches, interventions, mm -hmm. services, yes. et cetera. We should be moving away from more kind of generalizations and kind of, you know, one size fits all approaches to much more um, kind of creativity and innovation. And True. but you know, some of what people call centers. creativity is to me is regression, like, cause like, you know, separate is never equal. You know, like there's a lot of things that, you know, like I, I know that for people like the autism community is fairly young, but there've been, you know, the disability community is not like developmental disabilities and disabilities overall exist within and outside of autism. And I think that some of the things that people are, are you know, are, are crying for or asking for, um, you, you know, if we look at it from, from a cross disability lens, you know, like I think about my sister-in-law who has ALS, you know, she's not, she's not autistic, but there's a lot of things that, a lot of these types of policies that are very, that, uh, that very much impact her life because of her circumstances. And so I think that the, the problem is, I think that we, um, I think that people are scared they need something and they're scared to get rid of what's there instead of building something new. Like subminimum wage is something that I have a problem with. I, I do not think that every human being is capable. First of all, I don't think every human being should have to work. I don't think that's the value of you as in your inherent value as a human being. But there are some people for whom even with supported employment, well, even with all of these services in place where um, obtaining a, a job at a competitive wage is going to not be re a reality for that person. Um, and so I feel like why are we giving tax breaks to people to pay subminimum wage? Why don't there's so many, if, if we want people to have the dignity of being able to work and do something of value, why can't we have, you know, like, why can't it be an internship or an apprenticeship program? Like why, especially since some of the people, you know, have limitations on what they can earn anyway, so they still get benefits. Like why, you know, everyone can't do this a thing A or thing B, but it doesn't mean that we should stick with thing C because that exists. You know, we should make well, something- listen, if I would agree with you if those alternatives existed. We need to make right. them exist. Make <laughs> but those alternatives usually don't should. exist. But they should. It's, it's, yeah, it's they ridiculous should. that yeah. they're 
There's no, there's, there needs to be stricter legislation. Like a lot of the things that they allow people to do during COVID that they're now taking away suck. Why is it, oh, okay, for this two year period, your family member can provide these services, but now mm. they can't, oh no. Right, right. Um, oh, now you can do this virtually or online, or now we can waive this or this, but no, now we can't the rest of the time. That's crap. That's we, why, why is this day have program allowed to kick out people who can't do X, Y, or Z? To where there's 28 in the city and only two are you, you basically by, in, in reality, you're only eligible for two. And, you know, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. people are doing things that are lazy and convenient for them. Why are direct support workers making so little money that they may go make more if they decided to bag groceries? Right. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, it's disgusting. Uh, you know, like, so I think we need to fight for these. It doesn't have to be this way, though. A lot of things that we exist now weren't there before. We need to put pressure. We're, uh, we have numbers. You know, I mean, like you said, 3% of children, we all have loved ones and families. We have numbers. We need to work more strategically um, toward things that are going to change and, and, and matter um, instead of, you know, like there shouldn't be, all, you know, the limits that people were having in terms of being able to leave things behind for their children, you know, their adult children when they pass away or the way households are arranged. Like there's a lot of restrictive policies that don't have anything to do with the real world we live in today. I think we need to, there's a lot of stuff that we just need to, sh- to strip and redo. Um, and I think the thing that scares me is that I see people like needing to perform their trauma, f- feeling like, well, we need to perform our trauma and share the problems so that people will have empathy and do something for us. But that doesn't, that's not effective. And you don't see that in other uh, communities. Like that's not the way we shouldn't, people shouldn't have to display these things or beg um, by virtue of the fact that you're a taxpayer and you have a child and they're a human being, society it, it owes you something. You're paying into the services. You know, why we, we can pay all of this money for, um, you know, for entertainers and for all this nonsense and for executives, but we can't take care of our own people. The, no, the money is there. It's not allocated properly. You so, know, Moronica, if you had this magic wand, mm-hmm. right, and you could do one or two things to revise current policy as it relates to to autism and related developmental disabilities, what would you do? So one of the first things that I would do is ensure that there is a um, a viable wage for um, direct support workers, because I think a lot of people rely upon that help, but you get someone good and now they, they're they with you a year or two and then they quit. Um, so I think that having families would have a better, families deserve support. And I think that that would allow for, you know, having that would be, you know, having um, better pay, better training, longevity, you know, all of these types of things would be something that could impact people's lives right away. I think um, having medical providers um, develop some type of skill and understanding of uh, disability would be helpful. It shouldn't be that, oh, you can only go to this one doctor because they do sedation dentistry and they've got a six month waiting list so your kid can't get it or whatever, whatever. Why can't some of these other people, it, it shouldn't be like, oh, we can't deal with that. Sorry, go to the ER. Oh, well, sorry, we can't do this. We don't do this. We don't take this person. We don't do this. Too many people are passing the buck. If you're, you're going to be in this field, there should be a minimum or um, st- minimum standards as to what you should be able to, to um, address. You shouldn't be able to just turn people away because of your lack of familiarity. That's, uh, you know, unacceptable. Um, I think we need to have um, more inclusive um, um, policies and legislation about um, the support that, you know, families, a lot of times people are having to leave their job to care full-time for someone, um, but yet they also can't mm-hmm. be considered a provider, but you are providing. You're in there day in, day out doing everything. Right. Why can't they do these things? Why can't they be, be compensated for, you know, there's ways to, you know, you know, document it if people are worried about abuses. Who would do better? Who would care more than the person's own family? Often they're the ones who were doing it anyway. Um, why mm-hmm. not provide, you know, uh, why don't we have better um services like housing why don't we have options like you talked about the flexibility it shouldn't be this farmstead over here or this group home here like we should have a range of different types of housing um options that work for people that are you know inclusive that offer a variety of different services um and that are affordable like the cost of housing is ridiculous it's disgusting Mm -hmm. um and there needs to be accountability. When people get research funding, you need to be able to show the practical. You can't just get research and then you write up a couple of publications and that's it. You got the six-figure grant for five years and you did what? What a benefit? What, where, where's the layperson summary? Where's the benefit? Like, where's the relevance, you know, to it? I think you yep. should be able to, I don't think you should get funding again if you can't demonstrate 
how this could be you know, uh, replicated somewhere or how it could uh, translate into assistance or something of, of value to people right now, not just people seven decades from now in the future you know, with things. You know, I think that we need to cut down on a lot of things. Um, I think people, parents need to be told about their child's diagnoses and their, their needs in a way that's more respectful. It shouldn't be like telling you that your child is dying. You know, you sh shouldn't be throwing all these packets and call these people and set up for this when you have no coordination, no support, no help. You should have support and help with those things. Um, the school districts, I think, um, I, that, that's a whole other conversation about the Yeah, <laughs> that probably is. is. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Those are the things that I changed because I think those are things that need to be changed right now, right now that would impact a lot of people's lives and um, and they would help, you know, a lot of people, they would help the person who needs help with basic, you know, day to day, you know, um, you know, life skills and they would help the person who's higher functioning who maybe needs help with executive functioning or whatever, and they would help society overall. Well, I think that what you said, you almost wrote our policy brief because <laughs> when you look at our drafts, it, it kind of reads just like what you said. So, I mean, my God, I mean, you honestly like could be on our policy team and you, you there would be very little dispute. Tom, would you think she missed anything when, when she I, talked about her magic wand I, to change? I think policy? she's, um, I think she's right. Uh, keep in mind that I have experienced both the facilities that you talked about and mm. the sub minimum wage in my life i've been through both yeah. of those things yeah and um you know i i i agree about uh, pretty much all of that just as as jill seems to with the policy brief i i agree that um it, i i don't like the sub minimum wage any more than you do i know that because i've been there however you know jill is right there's nothing else and i don't think it's right that that there are people blaming parents for that you know yeah. parents are are doing the best that they can for their kids with what's available it's they're doing the, to, the, to the jump best on they can with what they have and and they're being they're they're being they're being blamed for that and they're 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 being attacked for 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 loving their kids enough to to try to to improve the quality of their lives and their kids' lives and their families' lives the best they can with, with what we have available. And yes, you're right. If all of those things changed, that would be better for all of us. But at this point, you know, Jill's magic wand is exactly what you're going to need because <laughs> that that those things are not there. Yeah. And and I being the realist and knowing the way that all of this works, because I've been buried in all of this, you know, for a long, long time, those things that you mention, if they do happen, are not going to happen for a very long time. You know, most of them you and I are not going to see in our lifetimes. And mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that we don't keep fighting for them. It doesn't mean that we don't keep working for them. We don't Absolutely. know. We don't know. Something strange might happen and all of this might appear somehow overnight. We don't know that. Exactly. But, but I do know that that, you know, going after the parents for things that are not their fault and not their responsibility is 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 not the right thing to do. I agree with and you. And I, I think, think some people I, have an issue. I think with you their and I do parents, agree on that. They take that on other parents. I think right. that like some people, I'm like, okay, so I'm sorry that your parents are abusive and they suck. Or I'm sorry that you work in this, you know, clinic or whatever and you see a lot of problematic parents. There's a lot of problematic of everything, you know, but I think that people need to try, like you mentioned, being a realist, you know, like look at, you know, like, did you see that parent on a really bad day? Have, have has that kid not slept for the last three days? You know what I mean? And is that kid um, you know, punched holes in the walls? And, and, and are you worried that your child has a bruise and you don't know where it came from, but your child can't talk, you know, and so you're upset because you don't know who's hurting your baby. So you're irritable. Like I think people need to take things in context. And I think the problem is our communication, because we do have a social communication disability, I think sometimes it can be hard for us to, we, you know, we have we have um, you know, effective empathy, but we don't really have cognitive empathy. So it's hard for these things to make sense to us. And I think that that's where um, 
you know, th that that's the part that hurts the most, I think, is that uh, ultimately what, we're all here because we want to help and we're fighting each other and that changes nothing. But I know that things like my parents were born under colonial rule. All those countries, you know, imperialism fell in a few generations. Look what happened just two years ago with George Floyd. You know, all these things that a lot of us in the black community have been screaming and begging for with these statues and with a lot of these things, all of a sudden people found funds and money and time to make it happen. Mm. It can happen if it's important. Um, the I think that people could do more. Um, I think autism is, is siloing itself too much and needs to coach its better in some of these more cross disability groups that are getting things done. Look at the developmental disabilities community. Look at what they've been able to achieve. You know, I feel like we 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 are small. We're big, but we're still too small. And we're, we need to learn from other groups that have been able to affect change. The HIV community, what they've been able to do in the same amount of time, literally from from the 80s to now, and the, H, the autism community is still stuck in the same spot. And they've progressed so much with services, with treatment, with research, with participatory involvement. We aren't there. We're not even close to being there. We're still bickering over nonsense and we're not going to get anywhere if we don't change. The bickering over nonsense is, you're right, not going to help anybody. We need to stop focusing on words and symbols and colors and start focusing on the things that matter. I've been saying this for a long, long time. You know, if you if you want to focus on things, focus on the things that matter. You know, if you want to fight for change, fight for change that is actually going to make a real difference in people's lives, not things like like symbols and words and colors and things that that are really much less important. You know, fight for the tangible things like you were talking about, the housing and the and the health care, you know, education, employment, you know, some something to stop the uh, the 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 sub and sub minimum wage that you were talking about, you know, things like that, the 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 better housing. So it's not so it's not the the farmstead or the group home or the institution other options, things that are going to make a real difference because you can change the symbol to anything. And I've, I've heard it all. I've heard the infinity symbol, the butterfly, the fingerprint, all of it. Yes, we can do that. But how it's, how's, how's that going to, how's that going to help Jill's son? You know, how's, how's that going to make a difference? And we, we need to, we need to be focusing on, on, on the deeper things, the things that we're not looking at, the the things, the things that are actually going to to make a a tangible positive change. Right. I agree. Right. I agree. I think there's there's room for some of those other smaller things, but I think too much is so imbalanced. So much energy, time, and attention is goes to that. So little goes to the areas that really need our, our focus. And meanwhile, that's not helping anybody's kid not wander um, out of the house and into a lake. It's not helping anybody's, um, you know, child that's being restrained, um, you know, prone restraint in a school or being abused and no one knows what's going on. That's not helping anybody right. not get kicked out of a group home. None of that is helping a freaking thing. Yeah. People, I think, you know, we could talk all day and we would <laughs> not come close to running out of topics. Uh, um, unfortunately, uh, we all uh, have to have to get going here. Um, but um, I felt like um, this was a really productive conversation. And I'm really glad that Monica, that you reached out to us. Um, yeah. And that Did Thomas I suggested this episode. Yeah. Did, sorry, I say Did I say yeah. something? You I think it's, may. it's important to say. Yes. So um, I want to share with everyone that I think that we all can grow and learn and change. Like, so uh, I think a, a week or two weeks ago, I, I went to an online profound autism conference and I'd always had this sense of, and I, except for maybe one speaker, the entire conference could have been one that like one of the ones that I speak at, or, you know, typical autism conference or research conference or what have you, even one hosted by neurodiversity, you know, individuals. There, there was not this like this this caricature that that people may seem to be in the things that they write and the things that they say, maybe out of desperation or fear, isn't the reality. Like I didn't see, like you know, I didn't see what I see when I read online. Those weren't the people that I saw, and so I think that I um. I think that it's important for people to kind of take a step back and learn and think a little bit 
um, because I feel like I've been upset, I've been frustrated, um, understandably so, and I can say whatever I want to say about NCSA, but how is that helping the people who are reading necessarily who may feel like, well, whoa, you know what I mean? Like this, I, this organization is like a lifeline to me. Are they going to pass me up when I have something this, you know, when, when they see my name on an article or whatever, because they're like, oh, she has no, she has no, she's saying what she's talking about. She's whatever. Like, you know, what, what greater message are we sending by the things that we do? Um, and there's a book out called, I Will Die on This Hill. It talks about the need to kind of find a middle ground between like non-autistic parents and um, autistic adults and how we need to like, because this hill that we're, you know, like, there's a bridge and if we burn it down, the kids that are standing on the bridge burn with us, you know? And so we, we need to change. And sometimes that means compromising certain things like, you know, I, you know, I have, and, and it doesn't mean compromising your ethics or your values. I think there's always going to be areas of disagreement, but I think we need to try to find those areas of commonality and support and help each other. Like, I'm not here for the parent uh, bullying and the parent bashing. I'm not here for it. And I call people out when they put, oh, could you believe this parent said, da, 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 da. you know, I'm like, well, where's the rest of the context? Because how do I know this parent's kid just wasn't diagnosed today? So maybe this parent is in like a really low place. Ask them in a month how they feel. You know what I mean? Like, don't, I feel like none of us should be judged by who we are at our worst um, or who we are when we're lost. And I think we need to look at, um, we just need to, we need to do things completely differently. What we're, we're, the road we're on now, the route we're going is not helping anyone aside from the strife. It's hindering the work of research and policy and these other things. We've got to, we've got to figure something out. There's got to be a, a ceasefire. I'm, I'm for that. <laughs> I'm ready for that. And, uh, and focusing on those areas of commonality. <laughs> Thomas, you can, you can have uh, just a quick few seconds here, and then we're going to close up. I, uh, I, I, I'm not sure what to add to that. I mean, I think I agree with it. Um, I, you know, the work, the work that I've done in the field, a lot of it has been compromised um, because it has to be. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because it's it's better to move forward a little bit than to not move forward at all you know as as uh, to me as long as we're moving forward no matter how slowly it happens it's a good thing because we could not be moving or we could be moving backwards you know and and i agree with you that we we have to find the middle ground the the question is 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 how to do it you know I'm, it I'm, I'm open to i'm open to these um that, you know those those ones that are that are that are doing the attacks they've got some some good ideas and there are things that i agree with them on it's just approach. that it's just that their approach is so horrific mm -hmm. that I can't I can't support them or have anything to, and I want to because I'm mm -hmm. like these guys have a great idea I'd love to help them with that but by doing that I affiliate myself mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. that and that's not something that I am willing to do right yeah. so the that, question the that question might is, be where we that right. might be where we start like we have to be willing to do these things like there's people that are going to cancel me and be like oh you were on NSCA's policy podcast oh you were this you were that you know there's people we have to be i think we need to step aside like i can say that i disagree with this this and the other and then i can also say well you know what maybe i shouldn't have called them martyr mommy because that's a, that's a loaded <laughs> term and i know it you know what i mean like it's not you know what i mean like do we have to go to the lowest denominator i can say that you know in my passion i've done i've said some things that have probably been counterproductive and though i stand on my principles and my beliefs i can try to take a more conciliatory approach that that would get farther. I think we can we can admit fault and move forward. And so I think that might be you having to agree with some of these people that you disagree with, while making it clear that you disagree with some of these other things. Like some people need to admit right. that something they've said about parents is wrong, unfair, and untrue. And some people, and I think the people need to um, admit that they're misrepresenting neurodiversity a great deal, and that they're erasing a lot of people, particularly those of us who are parents, who wear both hats. You know, like me being an autistic adult doesn't mean a thing if I, you know, when my child's having a meltdown. I mean, that's great, you know, good, but I mean, we're two different people. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm still a mom at the end of the day. I want my baby safe. So um, I think we all need to step back. I don't know how it's going to happen. Maybe conversations like this, maybe more of these. You know what I mean? Um, will help um, you know us all grow and change um, and change our direction. You know, because you know I appreciate what you've shared about like your lived experience with you know group homes institutionalization and 
and um, subminimum wage. I mean, like you've lived it and then you've talked to families and you've seen what they're, ha what they're having. This is not just a conversation for you. This is something that's real, just like it is for these families. Well, right, thank you. Right. I'm going to I'm going to have to bring this to a close, although I really appreciate everything that you guys just discussed. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so maybe this is to be continued, people. Maybe we will come back and, um, you know, go dig even deeper um, into these topics and into these ways to, as you said, find these areas of commonality where we can constructively move forward, which is really at the end of the day, what, what we need to do. So thank you guys. I appreciate it yeah. so much. And um, uh, this should go up, I don't know, pretty soon, it'll be in April. So pretty soon. Okay, thank you so much for okay. being willing to have us. Yeah. Thomas, thank you for coming up with this great idea. Um, it, it, was actually, it was actually you that had the idea, I think. <laughs> I, if if I remember right, it wasn't me. It was you oh, that approached well, some of the, the both elements of, us. of the idea that I think. Yeah. yeah. So I guess it was a shared idea. But I, I just want to say. Well, that, that might, maybe maybe we could both take a little credit for it. Yeah. Yeah. There's well, I'll take credit out there. I wanted to say to parents, a lot of times people are saying, "I'm the voice. I'm the I'm the voice." You're not. Hey. How are you? <laughs> there, there's a husband in the house. Okay. Uh, now I really so now I, I really I, have to go because yeah, I have to. I'm just saying you kiddo. are your child's voice. You know, you're not, you know, people say that you're not your child's voice. You're with your child every single day. You know that child and other people don't, you know, they, the child may, you know, other people have a, a perspective of the voice, but that doesn't dim your voice either. Don't feel like you can't share, talk, or fight for your baby. Still do. Speaking of Preach my baby, it. I got, I got to go take care of my baby. <laughs> All right, <laughs> All right people. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye.